All right, it is time to get started. Just to make sure I didn't miss anything here, I do not see Michael or Lydia or Sarah Kemp or James Pollock. Now, the new homework groups, I'm not going to have a homework group come up and do this homework problem for the simple reason that nobody knew who was in their group beforehand, so you could not have practiced with them. Um, the new homework groups are Wes, Nathan, and Trace. That's group one. Michael, Emily, and Max is group two. All the M's, counting Emily's an M. Um, group three is Andrew, Sarah Ha, and Kaylin. Group four is Mira, Ryan, and Lydia. Group five, Madison, Sarah Kemp, and Clayton. And group six, DJ, Leslie, and James. Okay, so that's who you'll be working with for the last problem and for problems next week, the next couple weeks. So let's look at this homework problem. I'm just going to do it myself so you still have a problem done at the beginning of this class. Military rifles have a mechanism for reducing the recoil forces of the gun on the person firing. An internal part recoils over a relatively large distance and is stopped by, damp <clears throat> by damping mechanisms in the gun. The larger distance reduces the average force needed to stop the internal part. So calculate the recoil velocity. That stuff there was just background. Calculate the recoil velocity in the horizontal direction in meters per second of a 0.8. 85 kilogram plunger that directly interacts with a 0.022 kilogram bullet fired at 625 meters per second from a gun. Take the firing direction to be positive. So what's the first thing I should do for this problem? Instead of an equation for the different momentums. Okay, before I do that, okay. draw a diagram. So I'm going to draw a diagram. So I'm going to have my plunger... And my bullet said to assume they directly interact. So I just put those two next to each other. And they start before I fire the gun. At zero velocity. Now when I fire the gun, still going to have the mass of the plunger. Still going to have the mass of the bullet. But now the mass of the bullet is 625 meters per second. Now we can answer this question without any special knowledge. What direction is that plunger going to be traveling? Toward the shooter. Toward the shooter, opposite direction of the bullet. You know that just from practical experience, right? Most of us do. We could also look at it mathematically. What was the initial momentum of the system? The system being the two things that are interacting here. What was the initial momentum there? Zero. Zero. Zero because momentum, remember, is mass times the velocity. At this point, in this case, I'm doing everything is one dimensional. Positive will be the direction of the bullet, so positive will be to the right. So in the second case, I have the bullet going to the right. If the total momentum has to be the same as the initial, the total initially was zero, then the plunger is going to have to go the opposite direction so they can add up to zero. And so I could use mathematically said, oh, I have good reason to say the velocity of the plunger final equals zero. And that was a very interesting, I meant to put velocity bullet final. Instead, I put mass of the bullet. And that's, so there's my picture. What made all of this happen? It was a very rapid redox reaction that occurred between the bullet and the plunger. A very rapid redox reaction convert a lot of chemical potential energy, something we don't talk about in this class, into thermal energy, making air move really fast. And that's what makes the bullet go. 
So I've drawn my picture. Now I go to what DJ said because somehow my brain said this is the momentum problem. Now, if this was on the test, you wouldn't have quite the context. We know we talked about momentum and momentum conservation last class period, so we had a really good reason to believe. This probably has to do with momentum. But if it's on the test, you have to look and say, how can I solve this? And then you're a little more, hmm, should I use Newton's second law method, work energy method, or is this something where conservation and momentum applies? And the truth is, I can't use the work energy method to solve it. Cannot. Why? Because I don't have a full accounting of the energy. There's a lot of energy. You know, we went from zero kinetic energy to a lot of kinetic energy here, but we don't know how its potential energy was released or where it goes. So I can't do it with a straight work energy relation. Can I do it with a Newton's second law relation? Kind of, but I don't know the time for the interaction. And so I can, I can make up a delta T and then have delta T cancel, and it will work using Newton's second law. Or I can use conservation momentum, which is actually based on Newton's second law. Newton's second law says change in momentum is equal to force net multiplied by change in time. And so in my case here, assuming there is no friction, then the net force on my system that's just these two objects is in the horizontal direction, zero. In the vertical direction, it wouldn't be zero, right? I'd have gravity acting as well. But in the horizontal direction, if there's no friction, then the net force is zero. And so if the net force is zero, then I can say, aha, then the change in momentum is going to be zero as well. Let me go one more step here before I continue. How do I know the net force on the system is zero? Is there going to be a force between the bullet and the plunger when the bullet is fired? Assuming the plunger is on one side of your blasting powder and the bullet's on the other. Is there a force between them? Okay, Ryan and Andrew both agree yes. And I'm going to go with them. If somebody wanted to say no, I could go with the technicality and agree with them as well. If you say no, you're saying, well, no, technically, the blasting powder is pushing on this and the blasting powder is pushing on that. And so they're not directly pushing on each other. But for our purposes, we can just ignore the blasting powder and just say it's a high-pressure gas produced when it combusts that is making it so there's equal and opposite forces. Newton's third law of reaction between the mass of the plunger and the mass of the bullet. And so Newton's third law equal and opposite means if I add up those two vectors, because they're both in my system, both the plunger and the bullet are in my system, so the forces between them are internal, they always have to add up to zero. So as long as I'm looking at all of the forces are just internal forces, ones between things in the system, it always has to add up to zero. So net or change of momentum is zero because the net force in the system is zero. And then I just get going. So what's my net momentum initial? We already said zero. Final would be mass of the plunger times velocity of the plunger final plus mass of the bullet times velocity of the bullet final. Now I know that I'd better end up with a negative value for that velocity of the plunger final because after all I have my arrow pointing that direction in the picture already. So now applying conservation momentum. Pretty simple equation. Solve that for the speed of the plunger. I'm going to have to subtract the speed of the bullet times the velocity of the bullet final. I have divide both sides by mass of the plunger, and I have 
the velocity of the plunger final equals minus the velocity of the bullet final times the mass of the bullet over the mass of the plunger. So with the numbers that I have here, that's going to come out to now I put my 16.18 meters per second. How many significant figures do I have in this answer? It's two, that's correct. Two because I had two in both of the masses. So the correct answer is six minus 16 meters per second, but when you put it into expert TA, put in my 16.18 if these are your numbers, just so it doesn't give you a round off error difference. Did I, I did it right, didn't I, Andrew? Okay, I saw you showing him the number on your calculator. I was like, oh, did I make a mistake? Okay, so there's the speed the plunger has. That's kind of good and interesting, but it doesn't really make you feel very satisfied. So that's why we have parts B and C. If this part is stopped over a distance of 21 centimeters, what average force in Newtons is exerted by the, or on it to stop it? So now I have a new picture that I'm gonna consider. I have my plunger. Now this says final, I'm going to change that final to two, or excuse me, to one. That's a one. And then this is going to be becoming zero. And we have a distance traveled of, in my case, 0 0.21 meters. I need to go from this information to an average force. Once again, if this is on a test, you're like, how do I go from initial speed, final speed and distance to average force? And there are two equivalent methods. So what method would you try to use if this was you? Because on the homework, it is. This is our physics part of the problem. Well, we have <laughs> physics in part A as well. Deciding that we were going to use conservation momentum was the physics part in part A and then applying it. Now, physics for part B, what method do we have here and how do we apply it? I can use kinematic equation, one-dimensional kinematic equation because it's one-dimensional motion, use the one without time, and I can calculate the acceleration. And then once I have the acceleration, what connects acceleration with force? Mass, Newton's second law. So that's one method. I could say acceleration is equal to V final squared minus V initial squared divided by 2 times the distance it travels equals zero minus 16.18 meters per second squared. So I could do that calculation. And so that's gonna be, notice it's negative that 
And so I get minus 623.0 meters per second squared. It's a pretty big acceleration. Excuse me? So force net is equal to mass time acceleration is equal to 0 0.85 kilograms times minus 623.0 meters per second squared. So in my case, that's 529.6. Now, what does the minus sign mean in this case? Okay, it actually, it actually should be a plus because my distance, technically my distance moved here was a negative as well. So it really should have been a plus. It should have been a minus sign there, which makes this a plus. So it should have been a plus. It's the net force acting on that plunger. And if I were tempted to put in the minus sign, I should look back at my picture and say, wait, the plunger was moving in the negative direction, it stops. That means the net force had to be in the forward direction to stop it. So it's always important to pay attention to those signs. Now, no one said the other method, but I'm going to do the other method as well. So this here was Newton's second law and kinematic equations. I could have also done work energy relation. My work non-conservative is equal to the force I'm looking for multiplied by the distance. And remember, those are vectors, so I put the vector signs in a dot product. The force is, again, I know it has to be forward. The distance is backwards. That's going to be a negative value. So I put that's equal to minus force net D. But what does the work energy relation say? There's two ways of writing it. Work net is equal to change in kinetic energy or work non-conservative is equal to change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. In this case, there is no conservative force. Conservative forces are forces that are gonna give you back the energy. They're things where path doesn't matter. Those examples that we have are exclusively force of a spring, the force of gravity right now. Those are the only conservative forces we have right now. Anything else, friction, it matters what path you take, how much work it's going to do. So it's non-conservative. Um, a person pushing, non-conservative. So in this case, we're going to have that's a non-conservative force. And so that's equal to the change in kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv final squared minus... So if we look at this real carefully, if I divide everything by D, minus D actually, factor out the M, good, I, I was afraid I'd forgotten the two there, but I didn't. If you look at this, you see that I have exactly the same equations I had before. I have this equation here, v final squared minus v initial squared over 2d, multiplied by the m. The minus sign there is because I'm going to use a positive value for the d. So it's the same ending equation, just a different way of getting there. Now the final part of this question asks, um, to see how effective this is, how big is the net force acting on the bullet 
And then we're going to go from that and say, if we didn't have this plunger mechanism, that would be the net force acting backward on the gun. And see how much that force was reduced. So we have now, if it was just the bullet and a solid gun, and it takes 10.5 seconds to accelerate, then I'm going to have acceleration is equal to change in speed over change in time is equal to the speed of that bullet, which was 625 meters per second minus zero divided by that time of 10.5 milliseconds. So 625 divided by 0 0.0105. Whoops. Is an acceleration of fifty nine thousand five hundred twenty three meters per second squared. Okay, that bullet accelerates very rapidly, and then the force net is equals the mass of the bullet times the acceleration of the bullet equals 0 0.022 kilograms. That's the mass of the bullet. Wait, was the mass of the bullet? Yeah, 0 0.022. So that's 1,000... 310 newtons. So the force that would have been, yes, did I make a mistake? Would, would you automatically convert the milliseconds into seconds in your calculation? Because your answer looks about right, but. Yes, I, I divide by 0 0.0105. Right. Yes. Double yeah, it, it's important to pay attention to the units when you're doing your calculations. And I think I did that right too. So 1310 newtons versus what did I have before? 529.6. It actually only cut the force in half. Is that what you got, Mira? Um, Someone in that ballpark? I mean, the numbers are different, so we won't get the same answer. But it seems like it should have cut it by more than in half. Because that's still a huge force. The 529.6 is still a huge force. Uh, what did you get for your answers? Because Mira and I did this just before yeah. class. For part B, what I got for my answer? Yeah, what did you get for part B? Part B was it in the hundreds? Yes. Okay, and then for part C, was it? It was in the thousands. Well, the, the ratio then was, the on, ratio was like, on the order of half. It's over in that ballpark. It's like 0.18 or something. 0.18. Yeah. Hmm. This here is, well, let's just do it. That divided by so yeah, mine's two point four seven two or one divided by that. So you have a much different number. Yeah. I, I do have very different numbers. So yeah, I think I did it right. Okay, so I did it myself because you didn't have time to work with your groups. Also, it was a pretty involved problem. It took me twenty five minutes. I did a lot of explanation. DJ. Um, what are the components of the force of BG and the force of BG? I'm still trying to figure that. Is it just like the the force of the bullet moving out? Is that like BG? Um, I, I want to load this up because it wasn't loading up before. I'll, I'll go back to it as soon as this gets loaded up. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just struggle with I was, terminology still, like even after. Okay, so the, um, for the terminology, I did get a little bit loose when I went on to part B with my terminology. In part A, things were very clear. I had VP initial, VP final, VB initial, VB final. That was all good. For the second part, then I was calculating the net force that was acting on the plunger to slow it down and stop it. And so for that then, I was looking exclusively at the plunger, so I didn't pay much attention to subscripts of P because it was only the plunger. 
And so my VF and V initial were the speed of the plunger immediately after the firing and the speed of the plunger when it comes to rest, which is zero. And the D was the distance that the plunger travels before it comes to rest. So I didn't, I didn't specify those as carefully as I could have. So the, the force net here, what, what I just call force net, yeah, oh, nice. That was yeah. the net force acting on the plunger after the bullet is fired until it stops. So it's moving for a while, and that's the average of the force acting for that time period. Uh, is that the entire system, like bullet gun plunger? No, just the force acting on the plunger. Okay, so we're just looking at the forces on the plunger, like the plunger and everything. For, for part B, yes. Okay, no, but for part like the, C, there's another. And then, yeah, part C, I calculated how much force acted on the bullet while it was being fired. And then I said, okay, if this plunger was just fixed in the gun, then equal and opposite forces means the bullet would have been applying the same force back on the gun. Without a plunger. If, if the, well, with a plunger that didn't move back and forth. If it was just yeah. fixed in the gun. Okay, so it would be the same force on the bullet, but the stuff going back would just be the plunger in the gun as a whole. Yes. Okay. Now Maybe this... Just, oh, okay, okay. I see. This so, brings us to, okay, go on, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to, so B uh, is with the plunger being able to move. Yes. And then, let's see the one. And then C, <laughs> and then and fixed. Fixed. TG is with it fixed. Part C yeah. is with it fixed. So the plunger is fixed in the gun. No motion. Mm -hmm. So that's, it basically is firing like a can. Okay. Right, the can has a fixed back end and saying how much force are you putting on the back end when you fire the cannonball. Okay. That's the part C was doing. Okay. Now, how many people here have fired something like a shotgun? Okay. We've got a reasonable number of people. First thing that you're told before you fire the shotgun, and what, what is that first thing? Shoulder weld. Yeah. Push it against your shoulder. Most of us, the first time we fired, probably didn't put it tightly enough against our shoulder, right? What happens if you don't put it tightly against your shoulder? It comes and it kicks hard on your shoulder. If you put it on your shoulder, it's not as bad. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Right? It's, it still pushes hard. Why is it pushing hard? What we did here. You have to have momentum conserved during the firing of the gun or pretty close. And then your body is going to stop that gun from moving backward. Now, if your shoulders against the gun initially, then you're going to be pushing your body at the same time that the gun starts moving. So the gun's never going to bang into your body. It starts touching your body and pushes your body. But if you start out here, the gun comes up to full speed and then it hits your body. And then you have a very rapid absorption of energy. So, you have the time during which you are stopping the gun is different if the gun comes flying at you versus if it starts touching you. And of course, you've probably seen those funny pictures. I should have put one in my presentation of a person like holding the scope up to their eyeball. <laughs> you, you know that those have to be staged and jokes because you would have a person without an eye if they did that very clearly. Um, which would not be funny. Just making sure we're clear on senses of humor. So, uh oh, step one didn't work. We talked about impulse, impulse being force times the time over which that force acts. And we said impulse is equal to change in momentum. So I don't like using the term impulse, but that idea of the Gun, having the gun against your shoulder is going to make so it takes more time for you to stop the gun, thus less average force. So this graph is showing realistic versus, let's do our physics calculation. Realistic is when something hits something, the force varies with time. And so you have this peak here that's maybe twice what the average is. For physics, we just say, okay, what's the average force? Not the same, but they give you a way of doing it. 
So if I do something like I hit a tennis ball with a tennis racket, and the tennis ball goes from 0 to 60 meters per second, and if we carefully measure the time that the tennis ball is on the racket, we can determine how much the average force is that was applied to the tennis ball by the racket. And of course, it's actually reasonably large when you get to making tennis balls go fast. 60 meters per second is uh, pretty fast, right? <laughs> I probably, I'm sure I can't do that just because I don't play tennis. So impulse, we often will make graphs, try to calculate the area under the graph. But for our problems, typically, we just say, what's the average force? Well, how is this important? Airbags. Cars, we want them to be safe. We don't want people to die. And so we have, first of all, seat belts. Now, of course, I was born before seatbelts were mandatory in cars. Um, one of my friends in college was arrested for arguing with the cop about this. It's pretty funny. Sometimes I can tell you the story if you actually want to hear it, but not during class because we don't have that time. Um, so what's the purpose? What's the purpose of a seatbelt? Let's start with the simple. What's your goal of having a seatbelt? Reduce the distance you can move. Okay. Trey says, reduce the distance you can move. That's actually a good one. As an EMT, the first call I ever went on, this guy had been tweaking for three days. He fell off a ladder, hurt his back, got in a car, was driving to the hospital, fell asleep, hit a tree. And you know, he didn't have me. When my grandsons were riding with me, I would say, buckle up for safety. Didn't have anybody saying buckle up for safety. So what happened to him? He went forward until his face hit something, which was the windshield. And so his nose was no longer discernible. That's actually what I wrote on the patient care report. Could not identify his nose. He's asking me, does it look bad? And well, oh, you're not gonna win any beauty contests. You, want to, you don't wanna just tell him, dude, you don't have a nose anymore. <laughs> um, so that was a bad outcome. So Trace's answer, keep you from moving. Keep your face from coming up and hitting that thing. Now, his head stopped really quickly when his face hit the windshield. If you go from a high speed to zero in very short amount of time, what does that tell you? A lot of force. A lot of force. So what we want to do is A, to keep your head from hitting the windshield, and B, a second thing, to spread out the time. So the first seat belts were just, well, you guys don't even remember the Yugo. But the Yugos, they came out with these cars, they were genius. One size fits all. Who needs an adjustable seat anyway? <laughs> um, and they still had the old fashioned seat belts. They had seat belts, yay. Bolted to the chassis, no gear. So you put that seat belt on, make it nice and tight. And if you get in a crash, well, it's just gonna hold you nice and tight. Well, that is safer, definitely safer. But these days, we want to spread out the time and make it even better. So these days, your seatbelt is attached to a spring. And if you get in an accident, that spring will stretch, and so you have more time if you come to a stop. More time means less force. less force, right? So this whole principle of net force is changing momentum divided by changing time. Then people got really smart and they put explosives in your cars. So, okay, I have to. I assume that this is gonna work. Bring up a video. Oh, it's gonna stop my recording. Well, maybe not. We'll see. I'll try not to screw anything up with the recording. Yeah, turn this back on. Oh yeah, how's it going? Okay, they're going to talk too much. This is the slow motion of an airbag deploying. Notice the big hole there. 
And notice you can tell by the rate at which things are moving that it was really slowed down. Oh, whoa! That's fast. That is so fast. Here, flapping about. That's straight in your face. Now, you notice the airbags never just explode because they're actually vented at the back. See this here? The explosion just puts air into a bag that is not even sealed. Okay, now there's a lot more to that, but I'm going to get back to the lecture because, you know, time being something we don't have an infinite amount of. Those things come out at about 200 miles an hour. If you are short, they can be dangerous. Because, and if you're short, I mean shorter than any of you. Okay. <laughs> I see people looking around. I, they always do when I say this. If, if you are short, I believe it's now a legal requirement that you can go in and have them disable the airbags because if you are like four foot six, you're sitting so close to that airbag, when it deploys, it's going to hit you at 200 miles an hour and cause some pretty severe damage. It's got the big holes in the back so it will deflate quickly. The goal is for that airbag to come up and be completely inflated before you get to it. And then you hit it, and it's got the big holes in the back, so it deflates rapidly, but it extends the amount of time for you to slow down by much more than you would get from just a seatbelt. And you have a nice, you know, cushion in front of you to stop you, and it's like a pillow. Off. And so these are adding to the time. They have some other benefits. They will sheet down in front of a window so that all of the glass is blocked by the airbag. That's good. Um, so they, you can see a bunch of airbags in this car. Some cars have like, you know, 18 airbags to cover different variations. You are, um, what, 30% less likely to have a fatality if you have head-on collision and you have airbags. So it's a very significant um, life-saving device. The whole point of it, to spread out the time so that you have a smaller amount of force um, acting on you. Okay, this slide here I have simply to identify systems. Making sure when we talk about collisions, we talk about a system containing the colliding objects. So here I have two cars colliding. My system is the two cars. Any force that's acting between the two cars is an internal force. When I do my net force acting on my system, the internal force is at zero always, so I simply don't worry about the internal forces. I only look at external. So in my picture, what possible external forces can I have? <coughs> Name the forces. What? The friction of the tires. Okay, force of friction on the tires. And you don't know what's going on. The rear one could be accelerating, which would make the force of friction forward. It could be braking, which makes the force of friction backward. Likewise for the front one. It's moving forward. But if you're speeding up, moving forward, then the friction is pushing you forward. Right. right, so we don't have enough information in this picture to know what the friction might be. In a real life situation, hopefully the person in the rear realizes, hey, I'm about to hit somebody and they're on the brake. The person in front, hopefully they're like, somebody's about to hit me, maybe I should speed up. But that would be, you know, hopeful. Other forces you could have, those would be the primary ones. Other forces you could have? Gravity and normal. Gravity and normal. We don't consider them because they're perpendicular to the motion. So we say, let's just look at the horizontal direction that some of the forces in the horizontal direction is all I care about. Okay, there's the last one, the drag force, air resistance. So we say during the collision, we're going to assume that the collision is a short enough time that the external forces, the friction, the air resistance, times the change in time are unimportant. There's another thing I usually don't mention, the internal forces. If those external forces are really big compared to the internal forces, or excuse me, I said that at least in the wrong way. If the internal forces are very big, I think I said compared to themselves. If the internal forces are very big compared to the external forces, then the external forces could be considered negligible, even if the delta T wasn't super short. So we have a number of reasons with the collision 
primarily we say collision happens so quickly that during the collision, delta T is approximately zero. Momentum is conserved during the collision. One more idea before I go back to solving another problem. Center of mass. The center of mass of an object is the average position of the mass. So you calculate by taking each piece of mass and multiplying by its position and then dividing by the total mass. It's the same as finding the average on a test. You take each test, you add them all up, and you divide by the total number of tests. Or if you have a test that has problems of different weights, you take the weight of each problem times its score, and then you divide by the total of all of the weights, and you get the average score. So the center of mass is the same idea. So I have up there in the top left the equation for the center of mass. This, have we talked about that symbol? Yes, we have, because we talked about net force. That means sum of, you add up all of the x sub i, m sub i. i is each piece, so the position x for each piece times that mass, divide by the sum of m sub i, divide by the total mass. Why is this important? Because the center of mass is going to move in accordance with the external forces. So if I have this pin and I toss it, what's the external force on this pin when I toss it? Like straight up, really? I'll toss it like this. What's the external force acting up? Gravity. Gravity, which is acting down. And so it's going to do a parabolic arc. The horizontal speed will stay constant because there's no force in that direction, ignoring air resistance. The vertical speed is going to slow down, stop, come back down. The center of mass will follow that perfect parabola, whereas the rest of the pin can flop all over the place around the center of mass. So when we're doing problems like a rocket that has two stages and separates, the center of mass of the two stages is still going to follow the parabolic arc. But if you jettison one stage and make it shoot back like this, then the other is going to have to shoot like that compared to the center of mass. So the center of mass stays following this arc. This stage may fall straight down, and this one goes up higher and farther. So it's often easy to analyze, easier, let me say, not easy, to analyze a problem by looking at the center of mass and calculating its motion, and then looking at the motion relative to the center of mass for the pieces that broke off, which I'm not going to do. This is something that's always done. When you have a collision, the cops come out there and they've got their little wheel and they measure off all the skid marks. Have you seen that? Responding to way too many car accidents to miss that. This picture down below shows the markings made by a computer of where the skids go. And they use that to then try to go back and use the physics that you now know to determine how fast were the cars moving initially. So you have a skid there. You say, okay, coefficient of friction between the tire and the road is this amount. It's skidded this far, so it lost this much energy during the skid. Then you have the collision. During the collision, momentum is conserved. After the collision, this one skidded like this, this one skidded like this, this one lost so much energy, this one lost so much energy. Then you just work it backward. So if it ends at zero and you have this much energy lost in the skid, you can calculate how fast it was going right after the collision. And so you calculate the velocities of the two right after the collision. Then you use conservation of momentum during the collision, and you can calculate how fast they were going before the collision. And then you go from there, fall back the skids to how fast they were going before they start skidding. And you can get a really good estimate of uh, Richard was going way too fast. He's the one at fault. You know, give him a ticket, and so on. Uh, it wouldn't be Richard, right? No, never. Um, I have this other picture. Conservation momentum is used in other things like you guys have heard of CERN where they discovered the Higgs boson. It's all in the news. They do that by colliding particles and using the same collision rules that we've been learning here. All of that said, I'm going to go back and do a pro. Oh, I only got four. Even when it's just me doing problems, time is never enough. I'm just going to tell you the story behind this and not solve the problem. When I first started teaching at PUC, 
they had recently changed from doing this demonstration. Actually doing this demonstration for a lab, they had two 22 rifles. And they set up the 22 rifles so you would shoot the bullet into a block of wood and measure how high the block of wood swung. And then you would calculate how fast the bullet came out of the gun. It's a great physics problem. It's one that I was going to work here. They stopped doing it. We still had the 22 rifles there, but they stopped doing it because you do have to aim the gun at the block of wood. And one student missed. And the bullet hit the wall and it hit something metal and ricocheted back through the classroom. Fortunately, it hit no one, but they decided, yes, this is not safe. So you know what we did instead? We had bows and arrows, and we put the arrows inside the PVC tube so you cannot miss, and fired the arrows and calculated how much energy was stored in the bow. So let me lay out the problem and the way to solve it. And then for the beginning problem next class period that will be solved by one of these homework groups that will be determined by the die of truth, you'll solve this problem. So you actually know exactly which problem it will be. And it's not a homework problem, it's this problem. So you have a block of wood, mass of the wood. You have a bullet, mass of the bullet. The bullet is coming at some speed, let's see. <laughs> I forgot to say the speed. V bullet initial is equal to, let's go with an easy 600 meters per second. I say an easy, I was looking at speeds because that's, almost twice the speed of sound. That's a reasonable speed for a bullet coming out of a gun. So it comes in with that speed. It hits the block of wood. Notice my bullet is set, so it's gonna hit the wood. This wood is hanging from a string that is, and assume this 0 0.55 meters is the length of the string to center of mass of the, bullet, of the block, which is the point we're gonna deal with. The bullet's coming in at that center mass as well, so no, it tips. The bullet embeds in the block. If it embeds in the block, then you have the final speed of the bullet is the same as the block after the end of the collision. And then the block is going to swing up and end at some height here. And you're to calculate that height. So you have the mass of the bullet, the mass of the block, the length of the string, which turns out to be unimportant to this problem, and the initial speed of the bullet. And you want to calculate how high that swings to. And then after you do that, calculate how much energy was lost to heat when the bullet embedded in the wood. So two parts to it. We're out of time. Have a great weekend.